here's a copy of Jordan's labs and it goes so right to left. So on the right side is the is the previous results from back in June of 2024. And then we have a December 2024 value on the left, so more recent. Um, and so some things I want to highlight for you to kind of go along with what Jordan was mentioning. Um, so if you get a, a regular primary care panel that everyone gets in their physicals, right, you usually get the lipid panel. And what that's going to include is your cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL, and LDL. That's been standard for decades and decades. And so if you look at Jordan's LDL when he first presented, you can see he was 124. So by most guidelines, when it comes to uh, primary prevention, meaning somebody that doesn't have any personal history of heart disease, but you still want to be, take the preventive step, usually looking at LDL levels over, uh, sorry, under 130. So you might look at that and be like, oh, we're, we're pretty good here. We're, we're good to go. But what we like to look at is a much better marker of risk, which is this apolipoprotein B number, which is a far better reflection of at least when you're thinking about the cholesterol portion of that cardiovascular risk equation, right? Many factors go into it, right? Blood pressure, inflammation, smoking, et cetera. But when we're just thinking about cholesterol, this apolipoprotein B is probably the best marker we have. It's a reflection of at the actual particles of pro the protein particles that are carrying around the cholesterol that could potentially lead to plaque formation. So um, Jordan, when he first came was 105 at that number there. So we know that over 90, when it comes to ApoB is a pretty um, higher risk level for that. So that's already a focus right there, seeing him, um, you know, a young, uh, soon to be father of multiple kids when he served saw us, um, wanting to be really proactive about uh, cardiovascular risk protection. So that was one thing that we had some strategies around initially. Um, and the other things on his labs that we'll point out here is you can see he really has got great labs. Quite honestly, there's not a lot to, to complain about here, but his uh, testosterone level when he first came to us was around 560 as total. And his, at this one, didn't have a free testosterone, but it's got a pretty good healthy sex hormone binding globulin level at 58. So that's actually a good prognostic sign there. So not, again, not low testosterone levels, but kind of in the middle, in the middle range there. Um, and, you know, his symptoms weren't really too concerning about somebody that had a low testosterone when he first came to us. He had a really good energy and drive and all this kind of thing. So just want to point that out because I know people would want to know what Jordan's uh, testosterone was when he first came. Um, and, and just to jump in, sorry, doctors, I am yeah. not taking testosterone, right? And I was telling the, sure. the like everyone, like I'm scared shitless of needles. I fucking hate needles. Uh, <laughs> I, know, I know there are ways to do TRT without like the needles, but I don't, I don't do testosterone. So just keeping that in mind, my testosterone was able to improve without that, just worthwhile. Correct. Absolutely. And so um, one of the things that we noticed here too, when we're looking at Jordan's initial labs is that, you know, his, his blood sugar control was, was okay, right? He had a fasting insulin of 6.3. His fasting glucose was, sorry, these labs are in order, was 87. So not a lot of insulin resistance, but some suggestion that area could be improved as well. Um, his A1C, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, kind of the three-month average of blood sugars was 5.2%. So, so pretty solid there, but pretty otherwise a pretty um, straightforward plan. I don't know, Jacob, if you want to jump in and kind of also help kind of decide what we did in the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, when Jordan first came to us, uh, his wife was just about ready to pop with uh, their second daughter. And... Um, he was struggling with a lot of sleepless nights. And um, with that, too, he was also um, stressed as one would be with an, uh, the arrival of a new child. So um, as a result, we did take a look at his neurosteroid cascade, which is his DHEA and uh, pregnenolone. So we were looking at his DHEA. Previously, he was at 252. Now, dihydroepiendosterone sulfate, for those that don't know, is uh, one of the uh, neurosteroids that are upstream of testosterone and estrogen. So they do downstream convert, and he was at 252. What we had considered were doing um, a 10-25 milligram split of DHEA and pregnenolone, and pregnenolone is uh, considered the mother hormone. So it's even more upstream of DHEA itself. With that, he really got within the uh, the upper reference range and was able to maximize his endogenous testosterone output. 
And then so too with that, we did want to improve other um, factors that would be coinciding with his endogenous testosterone production. So really trying to improve the, the tenets that are health, uh, that would be like improving your sleep, stress mitigation, uh, diet, so on and so forth. Uh, we have since reduced a lot of the alcohol consumption and Jordan by no means is an alcoholic by any means. Like he hardly ever drank, but he even reduced what little that he did to more considered negligible amounts, uh, which helped improve his REM sleep, his deep sleep in conjunction with utilizing things like magnesium glycinate, uh, really helping him slide down into um, that optimal range. Blood work is of critical importance if you want to understand what's going on with your body, whether that be preventing disease, optimizing performance, getting blood work done is incredibly important on at least a biannual basis, in my opinion, is what I do personally. Understandably so, knowing what to order and how to interpret it is beyond overwhelming. It's incredibly nuanced to interpret blood work with the level of rigor that is needed to actually assess the root cause of many underlying issues and or hit the perfect balance of optimization. And that's where Merrick Health comes in with highly educated coaches and medical providers who are always staying on the cutting edge, always on top of the most recent literature to give the most rigorous interpretation of your current health status, interpret if there's any ways to optimize your lifestyle, supplementation, sleep hygiene, diet, pharmacology. It's all taken into account here at Merrick Health. So if you want to take control of your health and or optimize your performance, check us out, MerrickHealth.com. With that, uh, we also wanted to optimize his thyroid output. Whenever you get to be in a very stressed state, um, your thyroid is one of the first things that start to tank. And uh, previously, he was at 2.7 when we first started. But by adding in more cofactors, which are vitamin A, E, D, zinc, selenium, iodine, and magnesium, we were able to up-crease that, up, uh, uptick that, and increase that to around 3. Ideally, you know, we'd like to get you around 3.5. Um, but being that he's still in a caloric deficit, we're showing signs of improvement, um, even though that uh, what range that we're currently at isn't where we want to be. So we're still making good progress moving forward. Um, with that being said, the other thing that we consider doing is upregulating the testosterone uh, and androgenic density using things like Tadalafil. And um, that is uh, something I'll let you touch a little bit more base on, Dr. Campbell. Yeah, yeah. So when it when it comes to looking at testosterone levels in, in young men, it's not always just about TRT. It's about what can we really do to to improve somebody's own body's production of testosterone and also improve that that ability of the testosterone to bind to the androgen receptor and have its effects, right? And so Jacob mentioned Tadalafil is one of the, the adjuncts that is good to use. And Tadalafil is also known as Cialis, right? A very popular drug for erectile dysfunction. The reason it works in that context is because it, it's a vasodilator. So it, it inhibits an enzyme so that you increase levels of nitric oxide, which is a potent vasodilator. So we don't use it in the context of erectile dysfunction here, but more in a lower daily dose in order to not only improve circulation, um, but also to help with that, some of those androgen receptor uh, density questions that we, we had about. So um, that can be a good adjunct. I think we'd also talked about uh, carnitine as well, um, but I, so the problem with that, well, not the problem, but the one of the caveats is that we like to do injectable L-carnitine just because of the increased bioavailability and mm -hmm. ability to bypass the gut. Sometimes people can have certain gut bacteria that can actually take the carnitine and, and break it down into something called trimethylamine, which is potentially damaging to the endothelium, which is the lining of the blood vessels and may have increased risk of heart disease. I know there's some controversy about, is that just correlation or causation? Nevertheless, it's still something that we, we think about when it comes to carnitine supplementation. So Jordan was not a fan, as you mentioned earlier, of injections. And so that was kind of one of the ones that was more or less tabled. You can take, again, oral L-carnitine, you just have to be careful. And the reason for that is, you know, carnitine can help shuttle fatty acids into the mitochondria to for fatty acid oxidation, so better energy production. And there is also some suggestive evidence that it may help, again, with the androgen receptor uh, density and, and those kind of things. So those are just an example of some of the adjuncts that we do. Um, we mentioned, I think Jacob already mentioned magnesium. Boron is another one we use a lot of at higher dosages to get 
um, an impact of that sex hormone binding globulin helping to free up some more testosterone. Um, but again, I, I think these are, are great things to do, especially when you have somebody that's that's younger, that's still interested in fertility. You don't want to just jump right to, to TRT in some of these, these cases. So 